Minister, welcome to In Conversation. Thank you very much for hosting me here. Lynn. Do you think that liquid natural gas could ever replace oil? We believe that all energy sources will, will be relevant, uh, at least for this transition period. Uh, us in the state of Qatar, uh, we see that uh, energy will remain a very relevant, cleaner and more reliable uh, source for a longer period because we see that it is the best alternative and the more realistic alternative toward the transition. Uh, now, is it going to be a total substitute of, of uh, fuel? It will take over gradually, and we have seen this, I mean, happening in different countries in the world. But we don't know when is, uh, you know, the time when it will be uh, uh, the substitute and what the other energy sources that will go along with it. Well, Qatar is making enormous investments, uh, if you like. You're placing your bets that it is going to be because you're opening up tremendous fields. In fact, that field is going to boost you to becoming the largest LNG exporter in the not-so-distant future. Well, actually, we are, I think, right now, uh, one of the largest. Uh, and uh, with the expansion, I mean, you know, uh, what we have seen with this energy poverty, which has been almost in the last few years, and uh, uh, this was due to a lot of things. One is, uh, you know, the policies that have been adopted uh, uh, for, you know, uh, to transforming to green and in, in an aggressive way, which sometimes it's not uh, realistic. And we have seen also uh, the suspension of new investments uh, in the energy field. Qatar decided that we are going to continue to pursue uh, our investment in, in the natural gas, which we believe will remain relevant. As we mentioned, it, it is a cleaner, uh, safer, and more reliable source, source of energy. So that's why we have invested a great amount of time also in making sure that uh, uh, our LNG is not, uh, you know, uh, uh, producing uh, harm uh, to the environment. That's why we have been now a regional leader in carbon capturing, a world leader in, in, in flame reduction. So it takes a lot of uh, you know, fork of to make uh, to be with this size of energy producing, but also responsible toward the environment. And we think that this expansion will help in stabilizing the energy market in in the near and in, in the near future, and also in the long term. The uh, head of the International Energy Agency says, though, that we must not use uh, you know things like LNG or anything else as a crutch so that we do not move over into renewables. Um, so uh, instead of weighing too much and saying, oh, we must just clean up uh, and, and use things like LNG, he says, well, we also will just should make that transition into renewables as well. I don't see any contradiction between both. Both of them, they can go side by side. And uh, we have mentioned that several times, that uh, uh, natural gas is, is the best way to transition to a cleaner energy. The price for oil and liquid natural gas has gone up to record highs in recent months. Do you think they're going to stay high? Well, I cannot predict about uh, the energy prices as, as I'm not a, the expert in that. But we have seen that uh, uh, the world post-COVID has, has changed. And there are a lot of consequences of, uh, of what COVID has, has made us uh, to go, uh, went through. So uh, uh, energy prices and also, you know, uh, the policies that have been adopted pre-COVID with, uh, with the green agenda has affected a lot uh, uh, the energy prices. It's not in any in anyone's interest, uh, neither the consumer nor the producer. I mean, us as a producer, energy supply stability and pricing stability is very important and key because we are a long-term uh, energy supplier. We are a long-term, we depend uh, mainly on the long-term contracts with, uh, uh, with countries. In, uh, in fact, we have a great partnership with uh, Asia and Europe, with both of them. And we have seen that uh, 
uh, pricing stability is, is important to continue this partnership and to solidify that. Do you ever get uh, your colleagues saying to you, you know, you could play a role in keeping inflation down by making sure that LNG prices are not too high, but making sure that there's a lot of supply? We have been a very reliable partner to all our uh, buyers. Uh, as I mentioned, we have long-term contracts with all of them and we continue our supply and we never uh, we never actually uh, delayed even uh, any shipment with uh, our partners and we have seen that the energy crisis is growing in the entire world we didn't we supply to asia we supply to europe as well and we didn't uh, give priority to one over the other we just stick to our contracts and we want to help to all our friends has been called the most beautiful game, but it does have an ugly side, brawling due to over-enthusiastic fans. How is Qatar going to handle these hooligans? Well, first of all, uh, we are very excited to host, you know, uh, the FIFA World Cup uh, in Doha in a few months from now, and uh, we are really looking forward to bring the world back together, you know, post-COVID now, I think it's the first big uh, event that brings happiness to people and we are really keen uh, to see that happening and we hope that everyone comes uh, to Doha to see our country and to enjoy our hospitality and also to behave <laughs> and when it comes to the oligans. From our perspective, we believe that any tournament it has its positive side, it has its negative side. Uh, you know, uh, some of the, uh, let's say, misbehavior of some of uh, the fans. I think that uh, our security protocol that uh, being put in place has been very strict to ensure the safety and security for everyone who is in Doha. And also uh, our, the security cooperation that we have with different countries and the crowd management protocol uh, will help a lot in minimizing uh, any negative impact uh, that might uh, associate it with the fan experience. And what we are focusing on really how to make the best fan experience for all our fans who are coming uh, there. And uh, Qatar is a peaceful country, so I believe even uh, those people who are you know, getting overexcited, when they see this peaceful environment, they will act peacefully as well. Some people say that football is not a celebration without a beer. Will beer be sold at the World Cup in Qatar? Well, there are designated areas where, uh, where it will be free for them to you know, do whatever they want. But also, we would like them to come and to enjoy the football and you know, respect our culture and experience it and enjoy it in, in the stadiums. Alcohol will not be allowed. What about all the stadiums that were built specially for the World Cup? What are you going to do with them after? Well, actually, uh, we've been taking this matter very seriously from a very early stage. Actually, uh, we have formed a, a legacy committee uh, back in 2013 or 14, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, the focus of, of this committee is really uh, about the legacy post the World Cup. And each stadium has a use after the World Cup, which is not necessarily for the football, but for other uses. Some of the stadiums will be uh, disassembled and shipped to uh, developing countries who are in need of, uh, of stadiums. 
and uh, there are uh, very interesting ideas uh, around the stadiums in Qatar and I hope that you will have the opportunity to come to Doha and to see uh, what's going on there and each stadium, what the story will be behind it. Each stadium being built for a purpose, that they will, it will host the World Cup, but after the World Cup it will be used for different purposes. So, uh, for example, there are uh, some ideas about a stadium which will be transformed to a major uh, health hub for hospitals, clinics and others. Uh, another stadium which will be dismantled and will be used for like we have one of the stadiums uh, on the shape of uh, it's actually built by shipping containers that they are going to be reused again and uh, the seating will be uh, donated to developing countries so uh, each stadium has a legacy and has its economic impact post the world cup that's that's what we've been planning for in the past in the past years, so it's not only due to the current inflation prices, but they've been, uh, uh, you know, uh, taking this process very thoughtfully in, in the past few years. What about the large number of foreign workers who've also been uh, in uh, Qatar building all these stadiums? Well, I think, uh, look, <laughs> there is an exaggeration that uh, most of the work is really related to the World Cup that they had done uh, in Doha. World Cup has significant contributions as infrastructure of the countries, but of the country which will, we will do, we would do it either with the World Cup or without the World Cup. The stadiums are just representing a very small portion of this project and Qatar will not stop growing. Growth will continue. We appreciate uh, the role that uh, uh, you know, the foreign workers has, has played in, in the development and the contribution to the development of our country. And uh, we are confident that there, there are uh, significant opportunities post the World Cup uh, in Qatar, whether it's on the expansion of uh, the gas production, uh, the economic diversification plan that Qatar has in place, uh, major infrastructure which are already uh, making Qatar as, uh, as a hub like the port, the airport, the airlines, uh, of course uh, uh, also a major sport event that we are going to host by 2030 with the Asian, uh, the Asian Games and there are more to come. So you're saying that people shouldn't get so fixated on just the World Cup as yeah. being that kind of driving force of infrastructure taking place Well, in, I think the Qatar. World Cup will be just the launching pad for a whole era of growth. And now, of course, the most important question, Foreign Minister, who do you think is going to win the World Cup? Well, uh, whom I think I cannot predict. Whom I wish, I wish Qatar. <laughs> <laughs>
and uh, we've been developing our relationship and progressing very well in, in, in some, with some countries. Uh, maybe there is a country which uh, didn't uh, match the pace of, of the other countries, but uh, we, we don't want to see a crisis or problems in our region. Uh, what brings us together is much more than what separates us. In 2017, some of your neighbors blockaded you. The United Nations said that the blockade was illegal, yet nothing changed. Qatar stayed blockaded. Do you think that the United Nations is toothless? Well, we believe that, uh, look, for us as small countries, multilateralism is a key. As small countries, we cannot act alone. We cannot uh, move alone. Addressing different issues, whether it's in the security, economic, health, we have seen, you know, uh, all the problems around us in the world. But coming together, we can uh, uh, provide at least uh, ourselves and other uh, friendly nations who are believing uh, in the same uh, in the same way, uh, the right way and the right approach to help. Uh, now, with what happened with the GCC crisis, uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, multilateralism has helped to a certain extent. We cannot uh, say it didn't help, but also it needs uh, it, it needed to be uh, looked at. You know, uh, UN uh, UN bodies needed to be reformed, needed to be revised. We cannot see the UN, you know, uh, since, since World War II until now, uh, no much changes happened to it. So the world has changed dramatically since World War II. And we hope that the UN also uh, will adopt to these changes. Is this a better than nothing approach, Minister? Well, of course, we are always, we are trying to deal, to deal with any matter positively and constructively. and. Uh, uh, we say, you know, uh, instead of, of just cursing the dark, uh, try to light a candle. It's at the, you know, uh, center of our foreign policy to preserve multilateralism, to try our best uh, to empower it and to uh, make sure that the reform, the right reforms are in place. The biggest American military base in the Middle East is in Qatar. Were you disappointed that the Americans didn't do more to stop the blockade? Well, I think, you know, uh, our relation uh, with the U.S. U.S. has been one of our greatest uh, strategic allies and, and partners. And we have a very strong institutional relationship. In fact, we are a host of more than 11,000 service uh, men and women. And, uh, of course, uh, the air base, al Adid air base, is, is one of the main air bases of the U.S. outside the United States. And, it is uh, uh, where, where it hosts the command center for the, the coalition against uh, ISIS. So our partnership has, has you know, uh, a multiple uh, sides and multiple faces. When the crisis started, uh, actually, uh, we, have, uh, we have seen a strong position from the U.S. institutions trying to put an end for this. They helped in the mediation and finding a solution for this. There was some miscommunication with part of the U.S. administration. We worked uh, uh, together with the institutions to rectify this. And uh, then we have seen uh, the contribution that they have did in order to achieve uh, the resolution. And you have seen how uh, this partnership between Qatar and the U.S. has has been only growing in the last few years. Some say that Qatar walks a tight rope, and especially now um, with the US and China in, in apparently some friction. Do you have any advice to your Southeast Asian colleagues about how to walk this tightrope between big countries when you're a small country? Well, actually, uh, you know, uh, most of the countries in the world, they don't want to see a polarization in the world. They don't want to see uh, big power competitions, and they don't want to take part of it. Of course, as I mentioned, U.S., one of our strongest strategic, most important allies. And from the other hand, China is our biggest uh, energy supplier. It's a political ally. And both of them, they have an important role to play uh, uh, in the global peace and stability. And we have seen that this tension will just lead us to more, more polarization and will make 
the world more uh, a difficult place for all of us. Yeah. And uh, our advice for, uh, you know, uh, for all uh, other countries who have uh, the similar situation, just maintain a friendly relationship with everyone, try to encourage both parties to solve uh, any differences and disagreement peacefully and to avoid any escalation. You've been having meetings at different times with uh, Secretary of State Blinken, and then you also have been talking to, in other meetings, with Foreign Minister Wang Yi. Do you say this to them, that you tell them that you'd both calm down? Well, definitely, if, uh, if the topic being raised with us, whether with the US or on, on China, we always say that uh, China is our partner and we want to continue. Uh, maintain the relationship with them and uh, anything that uh, any differences or disagreement we hope to be resolved and both sides has been always receptive to uh, uh, you know to constructive dialogue to engagement and i think that uh, that's the only way forward do you think that qatar will be forced to take sides at some point well i don't uh, you know i don't see it that way. Uh, we don't want to be uh, in a situation where we are choosing from one to another. And even if we will be in, in, in such a situation, we prefer to uh, make sure that we are friends with everyone and we don't put any relation at the account of the other relation. We want to maintain a good and very strong relationship with both of them. And do you think that's possible? It is indeed possible. We've been through a lot uh, in the past, and I think we can continue to in the present and the future. Minister, thank you very much for being on In Conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much for hosting me here today.